these people around to corrupt these presidents, we knew that standing in the shadows were the jackals. And they either overthrew governments or assassinated leaders. And so, although it was deeply, deeply disturbing to me, um, I, I was not terribly surprised when this happened. I, I liked both of these men tremendously. I knew Torrijos especially well and was a great admirer of his. And I was caught in this very, very difficult situation because my job was to corrupt him. And I really respected the fact that he wouldn't be corrupted. It gave me great hope. In fact, it changed my life. It got me out of being an economic hitman. On the other hand, I knew that if I wasn't able to corrupt him, something dire was likely to happen. Now, let's go back. You explain economic hitman and who you were working for. Well, really, we economic hitmen have managed to create the world's first truly global empire, I think. And, and we work for, for primarily to get U.S. corporations big jobs in other countries. We identify third world countries that have resources our corporations covet, like oil, or in this case, the, in, in Ecuador it was oil, in Panama it was the canal. And then we arrange huge loans for that country uh, from the World Bank or one of its sisters. But the money doesn't go to the country. Instead, it goes to our own corporations to build projects in that country, like power plants and, and industrial parks and highways that benefit a few rich people in addition to our corporations, but don't help the majority of the people who are too poor to buy electricity or don't have the skills to get jobs in industrial parks. And, and, and the, the, but the country is left holding a huge debt that it can't possibly repay. So at some point, we go back and say, listen, you know, you can't pay our debt. So Go along with us. Sell your oil real cheap to our oil companies. Let us allow it to stay with the canal. Let us build a military base in Ecuador, as we've done in, in, in Monta, Ecuador. And in that way, we've really managed to bring these countries around to our side to create this empire. Uh, when we fail, which doesn't happen too often, but that's what happened in Ecuador with Roldos and, and in Panama with Torrijos, then the jackals step in and either and overthrow the governments or assassinate the leaders. If the jackals also fail, that's what happened with Saddam Hussein in Iraq. Then and only then does the military go in. Just before Raul Reyes was killed, the commander of FARC, uh, the Colombian military, uh, in, went into Ecuador and killed him and a number of other people. You received an email. What did it say from I, Reyes? I did. I received a long email from Reyes uh, uh, plotting, applauding me for the book Confessions of an Economic Hitman, saying I had told the story very accurately and that he had documents that he wanted to share with me and in fact was on a peace mission when he went into Ecuador and a mission to to exchange hostages and try to strike a peace deal. Now I'm not trying to portray FARC as a great organization. They're, they're murderers, they're killers, and they're a very dangerous organization. But the fact is that they were trying to negotiate a peace settlement. And Colombia really doesn't want a peace settlement. Uribe, the president of Colombia at least doesn't, because he receives so much military aid from the United States and so much protection for the oil fields uh, that he really doesn't want peace. So what Reyes has, has, has was saying before he was assassinated was that they were trying to keep him from striking a peace deal. And the fact that Colombia sent these troops in illegally and killed 20, more than 20 uh, FARC representatives in Ecuador, uh, I think, substantiates what Reyes was telling me. This is Raul Reyes, the slain FARC commander. He was speaking in 1996. For peace, there has to be a policy that comes from the state. That means there has to be guarantees for the insurgency to sit with the government and to discuss about the new Colombia we should all construct. Right now, there are no guarantees. Right now, continued threats against the leaders of the guerrilla movements, the proliferation of murderers and massacres continues. The FARC commander who was just recently killed when Colombia raided uh, Ecuador and uh, got him, killed him at a FARC camp. Uh, that interview was done by WBAI's Mario Murillo, John Perkins. Well, you know, it's exactly as, as he was saying to me. They were trying to strike peace deal. There has to be a two-way street here. And Colombia is, is this standout nation in Latin America now that is not going along with, with all the other countries who are trying to really raise nationalism. I think there's an amazing revolution going on in Latin America. In the last, in this decade, nine countries representing more than 80 percent of the population have democratically and peacefully voted in presidents that say, we don't want any more war, we don't want any more terrorism, we don't want any more exploitation by foreign corporations. They're saying, we don't want foreign aid. 
We simply want to have the right to use our resources to help our people. And these are countries, Amy, every one of them, that during most of my lifetime were run by brutal dictators who were U.S. puppets. And now all that's changed in the last less than 10 years. And I think there's tremendous hope there. I think this, this gives hope for all of us here in the United States, for people in Africa and the Middle East, that diverse groups can come together and do what's right democratically and peacefully. Do you think uh, Chavez of Venezuela, Evo Morales of uh, Bolivia, uh, Correa of Ecuador have reason to fear, well, who you call the jackals? Absolutely. Uh, they do have reason to fear. And I know they're taking protection. I've, I've spoken with Correa. He's, he's exchanged letters with me. I was with Eva Morales on, on New Year's Eve a, a year ago. Um, Chavez has talked openly about this. I was just in Nicaragua with Daniel Ortega feels this way. They're taking steps, but probably most importantly is that they're banding together. There's so many of them now, it, it would be hard for the United States to send in enough jackals, uh, w w w it, you know, without raising a lot of world concern. However, you reported on this program, I think it was yesterday, that the fourth fleet has been taken out of mothballs, the U.S. naval fleet that, that goes into the Caribbean and South America that's been in mothballs since 1950 and is being called out. John Perkins, we have to leave it there, author of The Secret History of the American Empire, and that does it for the broadcast. Mark is now produced by Mike Berkshoof, Doug Ladusa, and Mata Angeli, Kama, Jeffrey Hagerman, Steve Martinez, Nicole Salazar, Hani Masood, Robbie Karen, Mike DeFilippo, Miguel Laguerre, Peter Curry's our engineers. Uh, I'll be in Michigan this weekend. Check our website, mokshinow.org. A very special welcome to Isaac Charles Rice, new son of Robin and David Rice. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks for joining us.